Good evening. Tonight is the 112th weekly meeting of the Carl Jung Deb Psychology Reading Group. Welcome. Um, before I begin, let me remind you that I have a goal of having uh, more views from subscribers than I have from non-subscribers. So if you w will, I hope you'll uh, hit the subscribe button and also uh, share this YouTube channel with your uh, social networking. Uh, that will be very helpful for me. It's been especially helpful uh, when people have shared it on Reddit. So I urge you to do that. And um, <laughs> says, yeah, police <laughs> sirens. Yes, there were. Um, they do come. <laughs> and uh, so welcome. The, um, so one of the things we've been talking about lately, and in order to give us a little warm-up time while people join the meeting, uh, I'd like to just read briefly. Uh, I'm reading from this book what is karma, what it is, karma, what it isn't, why it matters, by Trolley Kabon, Kabgon. Um, so this is obviously a Buddhist take on karma. But um, mind you, uh, Dr. Jung felt that a lot of his psychology was quite parallel to Buddhism. And so I'm going to read this uh, p little piece, or a bit of a piece, it's part of a chapter called Karmic Theory as a Possible Foundation for Ethics, and I think it's quite useful to us, so uh, I'd like to share it with you now, and then I'll come back to the main topic of the evening in our conversation uh, right after. So. Subscribing to karmic theory does not entail denying the inspiration some people have gained from their belief in God and the good works they have undertaken because of it. A person's ethical inspiration may well come from such a source, and it is something looked upon very favorably from a Buddhist perspective. We can certainly ground our ethical and moral values in beliefs other than karma and lead a morally edifying life as a theist or as a believer in secular ideas for that matter. Nevertheless, karmic theory offers an alternative perspective, a different kind of foundation to the theistic and atheistic varieties, a foundation that actually makes more sense in many ways as this chapter will argue. Good evening, welcome. To summarize very briefly, the theistic perspective in which there is an omniscient God regards our relationship to moral action as something that must take place in conformity to the wishes of the Almighty. If there is a divine plan, then all is created in accordance with this, including the physical world and our mental world, and it is up to us to find and work out our role within God's natural law. By doing so, by following scripture or the word of God, we prosper, but if we resist or deviate, we suffer. This is not a foreign idea even to Hinduism. Philosophically speaking, such thinking does not actually result in moral behavior. Acting in accordance with what we perceive to be a universal divine order is not being moral or ethical but is simply obeying the rules, which does not constitute a moral act. To act morally, we have to make choices. It comes down to weighing up decisions. Should I do this or should I not? Our desire is pitted against some other overriding consideration. Making decisions within this context of choice is being moral. Many theistic ideas on how to behave make no reference to such a choice. Secularist ideals fare little better as a foundation for ethical conduct. To take the very prominent ideal of human rights and justice as an example, 
though many have tried, no one has yet been able to build a firm ethical foundation on these premises. The most brilliant minds in Western philosophy and social science have failed to make a significant inroad. John Rawls was unable to do so in his classic, A Theory of Justice, and neither was Eugen Habermas in the area of political science and social philosophy. Commonly, it seems to be expected that the notions of justice and rights will be self-evident, but this is definitely not the case. They are far from self-evident. They are actually based on very flimsy grounds. Typical of ideas of this type, they are highly ideal in nature. What might constitute justice, for instance? The strategy generally undertaken involves creating many different possible scenarios in order to arrive at a definition of justice in an ideal situation, from which the theorist hopes to distill a workable ideal that is applicable to a multiplicity of situations. It is quite certain, however, that no existing society re resembles these ideal scenarios. Even at this abstract level, though, quite apart from any practical implementation, no matter how liberal and encompassing these theories are designed to be, they cannot be all-encompassing, as this is impossible. Other people simply do not agree with the models. There is a place for the idea of rights and justice, but it cannot be the basis for morality. As we have seen, what are rights for one group of people is a violation of rights of another group, and what is justice for one is injustice for the other. This is why we have so many conflicts. Terrorists are fighting for justice, anti-terrorists are fighting for justice, and so on. The question has to be asked, how effective is this invoking of the idea of rights and justice? Are conflicts being resolved this way? Just the idea of karma, its principles, has more value as a moral foundation than these secular ideas, even without its becoming a full-fledged belief system for an individual. Even on a pragmatic level, it is not better, for instance, to have rapists. I'm sorry, let me read that sentence again. Even on a pragmatic level, is it not better, for instance, to have rapists think that their crime is a depraved act than to have them simply scared of being locked up? This type of justice, as it is currently administered, does not really help matters because essentially no change comes from within the individual. Once offenders are released, they will most likely commit the same crime again. Our public debate is currently dominated by concerns over the right thing to do, with little attention paid to what might constitute a moral foundation for these decisions. Buddhism is able to address this situation aptly, for it teaches the wholesome or beneficial thing to do, not what is right or what is wrong. We ask ourselves, what is the beneficial thing to do for ourselves and others, and what is the least wholesome thing? Moral values do not come from without. They have to come from within. We cannot, we cannot having done something wrong, think it is not our fault. This is not to blame the victim, which has become a common criticism leveled at karmic theory in recent times. Karmic theory is not mechanical or simplistic in this fashion, as we have seen. It does not bluntly state that whatever happens to people is due to their karma, the seeds that they have planted, and that therefore they are at fault and deserve everything that comes to them. Such an idea is completely contrary to the Buddhist view. Also, of course, since Buddhism does not recognize an independent agent, there is also no independent moral agent that acts with full consciousness. A person who acts in full consciousness would be an enlightened being, a Buddha, in other words. But since Buddhas are uncommon, 
Most of us do stupid things out of ignorance, and as such, we are not as fully responsible for our actions as we would be if we acted in full knowledge of what we were doing. Some people may have a secret agenda at times, a real sense of premeditation and deliberateness, but that is a different matter. If we were to act in accordance with such an agenda, we would indeed face the full brunt of the karmic consequences that would follow. Mostly, though, our motivations are not so clear. We still suffer from the things that we do in ignorance, of course, but not in the same way. There is a wide range of possibilities based on intentionality, as we have seen. If we hit and kill a deer while driving, for instance, we are less karmically responsible than if we were to shoot a deer while hunting. The real distinction to be made with respect to karmic theory is that it relates directly to human nature and how we should interact with other human beings. Morality is grounded within an understanding of our own nature. Fundamentally, we should be moral because of the kind of beings we are. This is a most decisive advantage to the karmic approach. We are able to see how important it is to behave in a certain fashion, since it is very much in our self-interest. We are not asked to do such and such a thing because we must or have to, or because it is expected of us. Rather, we do certain things because upon reflection and contemplation, in understanding the sort of beings we are, the thoughts we have, how we feel, our desires and ambitions, we quite naturally come to some idea of what is needed to satisfy these ambitions, desires, and so forth. Morality, in this way, is intimately tied to our own sense of selfhood and identity. Therefore, when we behave ethically, we are being true to ourselves, and when we behave unethically, we are being untrue to ourselves. In being true to ourselves, we are creating good karma, and when we are untrue to ourselves, we are creating negative karma. Normally, we think of unethical behavior as scheming, scamming, lying, and otherwise deceiving other people in one shape or another. Yet in the end, it is actually self-deception that is the root of our moral corruption. Moral corruption has nothing to do with sin. It is not our sinful nature that propels us to engage in certain forms of action, but our inner corruption lying at the heart of our self-deceiving ways. We often think, I am doing this because it's good for me, but it is not good for all of us at all. Observing this in ourselves, in our nature, we can change tack and recognize the need for a different approach. Oh, okay, I should go about things differently if I am to get ahead, if I am to leave, lead a more fulfilling life. There must be another way. Doing things the way we always have is self-defeating technique, most often. It is not bearing fruit, nor will it. It is more useful to see ourselves as a work in progress, as opposing to having to find a real me hidden away somewhere. The Buddha placed no store in the idea of going on some kind of metaphysical quest for the self. He thought it to be futile, in fact, a wild goose chase. He thought a more practical approach to finding oneself was required. We begin to see and understand ourselves in terms of our nature, our very elastic human nature. Okay, so that's uh, the end of this brief reading for warm-up, and I've been reading for What is Karma? What It Isn't, Why It Matters, uh, by Charlie Gabon, Gabon. and um, I do not proselytize Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, um, Shintoism, or any other faith system, um, and um, I believe that we can take the good pieces from 
all uh, religious traditions. And so I'm always interested in figuring out uh, what the best approach is to things. And uh, so I'm not here proselytizing anything either. I'm just giving you the benefit of a discussion of how morality is formed. And as you see, there are other things from the th uh, theistic or the uh, atheistic points of view that may also work well enough. Um, so I'll take a look at your comments now and then we'll go on. And he says, hello, my weird friends. Uh, Tor says, hi, I'm relatively normal, says Granada. And D. Lara says, good evening. Hi, D. Lara, nice to see you. I hope to see you next week at our local meeting. Uh, Andy, uh, I'm out sane. Well, we're all sane, and that's what we have to do is persuade the rest of the world that we are. And Granada says, the golden rule is kind of like the Western version of karma. Yes, it is. You're correct. And it makes a heck of a lot of sense. Andy, karma is irrelevant if time is illusory. There is no cause and effect. Yet if this moment is the only real moment, how we act now affects our subjective pasts and futures. And... Um, in Buddhism, the only time that matters is now, okay? Uh, and um, there's a famous Yogi Berra uh, quote that was in uh, a book called, what was it called? Um, um, it was called Zen to Go, and it had a lot of Yogi Berra quotes, and one of them, Tom, Se Tom Seaver, uh, shouts over to Yogi as he's getting ready to pitch, and he says, Hey, Yogi, what time is it? And Yogi says, You mean now? <laughs> and <laughs> uh, it still makes me giggle, but there's only now. Um, so Truth says, Thank you for this reading. How do we join the study group? Uh, okay, the the advanced reading group uh, is uh, joined by sending an email to me. I will put my email address on here. And uh, we ask for a donation of uh, uh, $10 a month uh, just to show that you're somewhat committed to what we're doing in terms of the seminar. And uh, that can be paid via Patreon, via PayPal, using this email address, or also I found today it, it's also possible to do it through Facebook, although I haven't figured out how to get paid via Facebook. One other way would be uh, at the bottom of this chat string, you'll see a dollar sign, and that is a super chat, so if you wanted to uh, pay in that way, that would be paying through YouTube, and that would be acceptable as well. Um, and Miles says, thanking that I embrace the multiverse universe paradox. Well, uh, we have uh, 7.5 billion uh, universes going in society at any given moment. Okay, so in the last week, um, I have read into the system um, this book, uh, The Mystery of the Conjunctio, Alchemical Image of the Individuation, of Individuation by Edward F. Edinger. And so you'll find that in about 10 videos and also highlighted in a playlist on the uh, YouTube channel. Uh, I urge you to take a look at that because the images that appear, and this is the first image right here, which is called the Mandala Fountain. Um, the images in this book are uh, alchemical images, and the significance of these alchemical images 
to Dr. Jung was that these images came spontaneously from the unconscious of medieval human beings. And they came up at a time before what he calls epistemological criticism, meaning that they came up before people were, there were critics of the artwork, before there were people saying, no, this isn't right, and that sort of thing, for whatever reason, whether it be a religious reason, a political reason, or whatever. They were simply expressing things that were in the unconscious from a raw point of view. And so what Dr. Edinger has given us in these 10 images then is a cycle of individuation or development. And that cycle can apply to um, not only the individual, but it can apply to the development of a relationship uh, in a marriage or any relationship between two people. Um, and it can also apply to any organization, whether it's your bridge club or your, um, uh, your church, your Boy Scout troop, um, you know, the Kiwanis, or your state and local governments, your national government, or humanity itself. We're all individuating. And when Dr. Jung is talking about the alchemical vas, um, which means cauldron, uh, he means all of those things. And the alchemical vas is here, or it's a collection of psyches. And so how those things come together is the question. I once had a mentor who uh, said to me, every time he adds a person to a group or a person leaves a group, it changes the group. And, you know, that's like making soup. Every time you put a new ingredient in the soup, it changes the soup. And uh, so it is in alchemy and so it is in psychology, which is the, uh, what Dr. Jung was talking about and why he got so interested in alchemy, because this is what the alchemists were doing. They were making a soup to help people um, individuate. And so, uh, anyway, uh, so, the, so the way I uh, decided to proceed, and uh, I'm, ho I'm hoping my uh, friend Ed is here. Maybe he is. If he is, he could say hello on the chat just to, so I know that he's here. Um, we have uh, new visitors at any given time. Uh, Andy says, Skip gives me hope. Thank you, uh, Andy. I appreciate that. And uh, Andy says, the simplest, most elegant answer is usually correct. Also, everything I grew up hating appears to be true, like it's opposite day after day. Um, like it's opposite day every day. <laughs> yeah, I mean... This is what I'm learning. I mean, I, uh, I certainly was brought up in a fairly Christian household. And Ed, nice to see you. I'll uh, respond to your nice long email uh, tomorrow morning if possible. Um, and I hadn't thought about doing it on uh, Google Hangouts, but we could try that. Um, so... Um, but there were quite a lot of things that I didn't understand, and, and I had the same quandary that most scientifically-minded Christians have, which is, you know, how can you be talking about the, you know, all these stories of the Bible when they can't possibly be true? What, is it, what does that mean? And so it's only by... Um, studying Dr. Young that I could start to understand those things. And that, you know, includes uh, visitation by the devil himself, as you probably all know. I had that vision one night, and um, uh, 
you know, you definitely want to figure out what the heck that means if you have that vision. Um, and um, Alex says, in alchemy, it is questions that are paired to answers. Um, yeah, I mean, they certainly attempted to do that. They're, it's a very interesting uh, development, and uh, Dr. Jung covered this history of the human psyche in several different books. Um, he certainly did it in this one, which we're working with tonight, Psychology and Alchemy. But he also uh, did it in Ion, which is volume 9 2 of the collected works, and he did it in Mysterium Conjunctionis. And so let me mention that in the last eight months in our advanced seminar, we have done this book, Ion. It took us eight months to get through it in terms of a seminar pr presentation. And as of this Monday or this this Wednesday, which will be the last session, um, we will have 32 sessions. All of these have been recorded on Zoom, and they are all uh, available in the Advanced Reading Group Dropbox, which uh, you can gain access to if you want to um, join our Advanced Reading Group. Um, but the reason I held the other one up is. The next one we're going to do is Mysterium Conjunctionis. Uh, this will begin on February the 6th, and my estimate is that that's going to take well over a year uh, to go through Mysterium Conjunctionis. And what I have done, and I'm going to continue to do a little bit, is give a few little teasers in the general YouTube channel. One of those teasers was the 10 uh, images from this book, uh, the Conjunctio, but there are a couple of others that I'll be reading soon uh, that will be teasers for that uh, advanced seminar. And so you can join that advanced se seminar at any point, but if you participate live, you're going to have uh, more fun because you're going to be part of the video and you'll be able to get your ideas across and ask your questions live. Uh, if you uh, just watch the playback later on, you can't, you don't have this interaction. So that's the benefit of participating live. And that live interaction is done at 1.30 p.m. Eastern U.S. time every Wednesday. And the reason for that time is that it allows European uh, followers to also participate. And um, uh, so, okay, so I guess that's enough of a promo on that. Okay, Alex says, Miles says, the possibility of karma is too scary for me even to talk about. Okay, well, um, yeah, I mean, karma it, to me is in a way scary because in my experience in life, it works perfectly. In other words, if something happens to me in a negative way for some reason, uh, I think the, the instinctual reaction is to um, get even. Uh, you know, and what I have found is that I don't need to do anything because karma takes care of it for me. And so if I get angry at someone for some slight they've aimed at me, I just stand back and watch them pay the consequences because it does come, come around. It's Buddhist concept would be what goes around comes around and it does come around and so You know whenever something like that happens to me. I just back up and Say okay, if that's the way you want it. Good luck to you. And I and then I have to do nothing uh, Alex says one must not abstain from paying ransom to one's dead in emulation of the changeful 
the psychological manifold is simply modeled after the effects of the zodiac wheel as in alchemy it is similar i.e. it belongs to the essence of forward movement that what was returns bringing the ancient in the changeful how can it changeful how can it be otherwise rejuvenates the significance um, yep that's a way to put it Andy says Alex being scared of your karma only weighs the scales against you um, I mean I, I I don't think you could necessarily do anything about it in that uh, active way Ed says karma it is said that in nature there is no morality morality only comes up with man who is conscious and can make it rational make rational choices but can it be said that man is rational um, well um, man is both rational and irrational and even rational men are irrational and so on um, let's see Alex is an alchemy once entering the nether realm so to speak you do not come as a proud pariah but as a fool gazing at the scraps that have fallen from one's table um, okay that's a interesting metaphor um, Andy says because morality is observed in other animals besides man um, yeah I think it does happen in that way um, and that there is karma in all species um, it says or that the universe is rational uh, can morality exist if instinct is the primal driver of behaviors um, well I think that the universe outside of human beings uh, essentially uh, you know is moral <laughs> it's perfectly moral and it's it's doing what it does which is to um, follow the spirit uh, through to something I mean um, as Dr. Jung rightly said um, you know there were those herds of gazelles and elephants and so on out there on the on the plains of Central Africa for hundreds of millions of years before human beings came along and um, you know they all evolved they all evolved in a different way one way or another uh, but it's only we who can change our evolution at some level and uh, maybe we can change it from a psychological level that's a open question still and Grenade says Edward that is a good point it's hard to grapple with the fact that the emotions are what comes first and the rationalizations come after um, Miles says the karma that may have come down on someone is what I won't discuss it is too speculative but if true a truly horrible thing happened um, yeah <laughs> uh, and uh, I think we're about to see karma playing out in our national news media so let us go to psychology and alchemy um, this week um, if you'll recall last week I showed you paragraphs 11 and 12 as they appear in my copy of psychology and alchemy um, and Andy says follow the developments in AI they no longer try to program morality it is an emergent property of our universe a law so pervasive it invades the digital realm um, I yeah I think that's fairly true I think we're very far from true AI okay I've been uh, in the industry I worked in uh, voice recognition was always a big thing and voice rec recognition really has not improved very dramatically since I was first working on it 
25 years ago. And I, I found it quite interesting that uh, in Edward O. Wilson's book, Consilience, that one of our subscribers brought my attention to, which is about mainly about biology, Edward O. Wilson, who's a professor of biology at, or was at Harvard University, um, said that, and this was 25 years ago, so I'm not sure this is true today, but he said, um, you know, biologists still don't know how an insulin molecule operates. He says it has something like 51 amino acids in it, and they have no idea how it actually operates. And so if biologists are that far from understanding how, um, how uh, living things operate, I think we're very far uh, from having that go over to artificial intelligence. I think we can probably create the devil's cauldron with some things we do with what we think is art artificial intelligence, but real artificial intelligence is going to be a long way away. Um, and Granada says, everything is emergent, really, if you think about it, sure. Uh, Andy says, yes, sir. Alex says, set the egg before you, the God in his beginning, and behold it and incubate it with the magical warmth of your gaze. When it hatches, one must not confuse privilege with competence. Um, I suppose that might be a, a quote from the Red Book. I'm not sure, Alex, but... Um, you know, that's, uh, you know, things emerge from all of us all the time. So I want to go back now to these two paragraphs of uh, psychology and alchemy. And uh, what I was pointing out was these are the two paragraphs in my book, and they actually go over to the next page. So Dr. Jung was in the habit, according to Edward Edinger, of uh, putting a psychic fact in each paragraph. So each paragraph represents a psychic fact. And so psychic facts are, um, are more like, um, uh, well, let's see, did I have that? in front of me. I did have at one point, but I think I... If I'm lucky, I found it. Let's see. Ah, yes. Okay, so here we go. Uh, this is another alchemy book. This this book is uh, The Anatomy of the Psyche, uh, Alchemical Symbolism in Psychotherapy by Edward F. Edinger. And uh, so he has a chapter in here for each stage of the alchemical process. And so in um, each stage, this is an example of coagulatio. And as you see, it has many different roots, and if you've ever taken a poetry class, you'll know that the way to write a good poem is to take your central idea and put it in the middle of a diagram like this, and then put every different association you can make to your original idea in the image, and uh, then you'll have a good poem that will uh, hold together. And so that's the way psychic facts work. Also, according to Dr. Edinger, and I have no reason to doubt him since he was the leading union analyst of the late 20th century. I really have no idea what crashed down there. Oh well, I'll get it when I get it. Um, okay, so in order to get into uh, these two paragraphs, we have to talk about the soul for a minute. 
and there is a, an eight page long definition of soul. I think I actually read it into the channel. Uh, I don't have the uh, I don't have the link just now. Although I suppose I could see if I can find it. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Um, not sure. Should be able to tell very quickly. Um, but anyway, soul is one of these things that in the book um, Psychological Types, which is volume six, um, Dr. Jung has about a 200 page set of definitions. And so one of the definitions in that book is soul and so let me just see if it comes up easily um doesn't seem so Anyway, um, so if you go into volume six, into the end of it, you'll find this very long definition of soul. And, uh, ah, here we go. Definition of soul and soul image. So let me give you that link. If I can get it here. question is always if I leave the live stream page will you still be there when I come back and uh, okay so that is the link to soul um, as I read it into the system I hope I didn't throw you offline when I did that um, and uh, Andy says, is, Andy says, as someone raised interdenominational Christian, I was a little taken aback by the concepts of body, spirit, and soul being three separate concepts. Um, well, you know, as soon as you start talking about anything, you start slicing and dicing, and that's the problem with the logos because anytime there's anything, any word um, stated in Logos, then you immediately slice and dice it. And in fact, um, you know, I can't say any word and know with clarity what you will think of it. I can, I can have my general idea, but if I say the word uh, yacht, which is one of 12 Dutch words in the English language, uh, and it literally means small boat. I don't know if you're going to think of a rowboat or a 43-foot sailing yacht or power yacht or something that looks like the Queen Mary. And, uh, uh, you know, so when I said that word, you know, what, what came to your mind when I said that word? Um, and... So uh, we can only sort of approximate <laughs> and hope for the best. Um, and uh, especially spirit and soul are rather complicated and confusing within uh, Dr. Jung's oeuvre because he, uh, I think he amended his point of view over many years and um, and he sort of mixed them over that time. And so it, it is confusing and you have to make your own judgment. Um, and, uh, okay, so Andy says, the Roman Catholics edited the meanings of soul spirit and body so that 
plebeians w wouldn't get confused. I suppose so. Um, and Alex says, how is it conceivable that uh, Greek word signifies both the auspices of the notion of the incantatory spell and that of a poison? What kind of apotropaic feedback inhibition is this? Well, all things are their opposites. And let me just say, and this is a good time to mention it since Alex has um, dazzled us with his erudition by writing in Greek. Um, there is a Greek alphabet available on uh, the World Wide Web, and Dr. Edinger um, highly recommended that if you're going to get into Dr. Jung's work, it would be a good idea to um, memorize the Greek alphabet, which is fairly simple and would only take you about an hour. I found that I can do a translation um, using, um, using this, and uh, it's time consuming, so I'm not going to do it here tonight. Uh, but the other alternative is to take Alex's Greek word here and just put it into Google Translate. Uh, so that I can do. And, uh, and then we get uh, the, the word that he's said or its meaning. Um, and so let's give it a go since I have Greek set up here. And the, the translation of this word, which is pharmacon, makes good sense. Pharmacon is medicine. So um, thank you, Alex, for uh, making us look that up because it reminded me to talk to people about the Greek alphabet. Um, the logos lies behind the definition of the mysteries, i.e. it was lost, but yet its very function still constitutes its form. Well, the Logos does create form, and you just ask Jordan Peterson and he'll tell you how it saves us from chaos. But the problem is that uh, there's no life in the Logos. And if you look at, um, if you look at paragraph fifth, uh, 63, paragraph 63 of Ion, which is volume, uh, nine two of the collected works, paragraph sixty three. You'll hear what Dr. Jung thinks about zoological criticism of the platypus. Okay, so you can, in a zoological textbook or encyclopedia or anywhere on Wikipedia, you can have a definition of what a platypus is. But Dr. Jung's point is that. Um, the platypus himself is untouched <laughs> by anything that you say <laughs> in the logos about him. Uh, the platypus simply is and goes on living his life. Um, and uh, so let's see. Alex says, this magic is dangerous. Every serial sequence distills a distinct potion, regardless of one's naive intention for a synthesized unio oppositorum, even the one which elevates and debases the spirit of the times. The contraries might not engender the opposites, but neither do the complementaries. Uh, is Ion the one and the same with Phanis then? I don't know. Um, and does the yearning for absolution from the conjunctio lead to the profession that is the Prometheic declaration for the resurgence of Parmenides and Empedocles? Well, I would say um, I would say uh, that um, it was Peter Kingsley that uh, resurrected 
<laughs> Parmenides and Empedocles, and otherwise they would be lost to us in time. And so these things amount to um, a vase, and no matter what you say about them, and no matter how you criticize them, uh, they will mix in their own way, whether we, um, whether we uh, like it or not. And uh, D. Lara here is reminding me, don't, don't get you going on the platypus, <laughs> because uh, if you look at my video about the, about that particular uh, paragraph, which I discussed in group one night, um, I, I just got out of control because the platypus really doesn't care what we say about him. And, uh, and so whatever we say, I mean, this is why, um, this is why Representative Scalise could say when Steve Bannon came over to the uh, House of Representatives to order the GOP caucus to do a certain thing, um, Steve Scalise, who was the <clears throat> he's the minority whip now, um, and he's the man who was shot at the softball game that time. Uh, he uh, said, I haven't been spoken like that, to like that, since I was 18, and my father did it, and I didn't listen to him then either. <laughs> and, and so that's the way it is for all of us. I mean, we don't, um, you know, if... If you say something that I absolutely don't agree with, it just rolls off my back, and uh, it probably isn't going to change my mind, and that would be true of all of you as well. And so uh, this is why I uh, mostly try to just offer what Dr. Jung was saying. I mean, I sometimes talk about how it affects or has affected my own life so that just as an example but it's up to all of you to decide how these things affect your life and he says we relive those archetypal modalities in everything today mythology is alive and well in modern culture iron man 2 is on netflix uh the king's sight and vision dismantles itself from the great pyramid in rome's across all that is touched by the sun and evil is at last given life and sentience the tree has now obtained the ability to extend its roots and dismiss all unnecessary manifold comprehensions except that of direction truly one saves one's god from certain death by means of integrating him into fantasy well i would say also by means of integrating him into ourselves but uh it so happens that i uh, did bring up a um, one of these pre-human uh ideas so that um, uh, you can get an idea because we're going to talk about archetype in the next paragraph and so here is this is the archetype of mother uh, this is a um, this is the decora eagle and she's on her nest in decora iowa and even th though she had the snow coming down upon her she has three eggs under her and she will not move you can see just how um, committed she is to keeping her eggs warm uh, and that is probably the most powerful archetype in the universe and that's the archetype of mother and that archetype was there long before there were human beings um, and that's my proof of it <laughs> such as it is um, now, let's see. Um, Andy says, you better stock up on Parmenides and Empedocles books real fast for this 
to quantify in any way as a resurgence. Uh, okay, well, I'm not into that, Andy. Uh, uh, and I'm not urging a resurgence per se. I'm What I say and the reason that I do this channel is because Dr. Young's writing has been helpful to me and my psychic development and uh, my life for the last 32 years and um, and I felt so strongly about how much it has helped my life uh, by reading this work uh, that I started this channel and um, you know, if you or someone else wants to talk about Parmenides or Empedocles, um, that's fine by me. I have no objection. Peter Kingsley uh, wrote a whole book about it. Uh, and for my lights, uh, the, the book came down to uh, one point at the end, which was that um, the priests of... Um, pre-Christian era Greece and southern Italy, um, where these men were involved, uh, were actually early psychotherapists. That's my um, reaction uh, based on, on what Peter Kingsley was saying. Um, and so, whatever. And so Miles says, I, instead of talking about the logos of the platypus, bring up the logos of nuclear weapons pointed at us on hair trigger and polite company at a luncheon and see the reaction of the faces people need young <laughs> definitely and he says people actually need governmental funded frontal lobe lobotomies uh, well I'm sure uh, the certain members of our government would be happy to give them to all of us and uh, they've certainly tried by um, removing social studies from the uh, curriculum in many public schools, uh, but they didn't, uh, they didn't uh, reckon with the idea of the World Wide Web and the fact that now we have uh, first graders who can read anything they won. And so recently I saw a story where I think it was a seven-year-old uh, who was, uh, uh, he was going to go into the second grade and also graduate with some college degree at the same time. So I think uh, we're all at different levels of development and we have to uh, figure out where that goes. Um, and uh, and he says, Steve Bannon, perhaps, wanting to give us the lobotomies. Ed says, uh, but we the people appreciate your best efforts, Skip, to save us. Well, I'm not trying to save much of anyone. Um, I, I think that we all have to save ourselves. And um, if we think more deeply and reflect more deeply, uh, we're going to understand that. And so there have been a couple of requests put on me recently, or one request, which was that I speak on one evening uh, about my experiences overseas. And uh, those experiences are quite broad, as you might guess. Um, and I'll give you... Uh, I will give you a sense of it. Uh, let me see, where is that? Okay. Um, I wrote this essay about one of my experiences in Turkey, and you can take it for what it's worth. Um, and um, if you want to know some of the real details of my experience in Japan, uh, you can read my novel, which is available on the Dropbox 
called Mako Memoirs of a Woman. And um, that is autobiographical. It's written under my pen name, which is David Gerritsen. Um, and it, it's free. I'm not asking you to buy the novel, but if you read it, you pretty much get a um, autobiographical experience. And so everything in that novel either happened to me or to someone I know intimately. Let's put it that way. And it's rather mild compared to what would actually happen. Uh, so if you're interested in those things, uh, you can get into the deep weeds about it. Um, and uh, Andy, no, I've never read The Black Pullet, what is, who is the author. Um, I've never read that. Um, so. So, I, as you see, the name of my essay is I Am Guilty, I Am a Provocateur, and um, I Am Still That, which is what this YouTube channel is all about. Okay, so I want to talk about soul for, for a minute, because as I said, in uh, Psychological Types, which is volume six of the collected works, you all, if you're on the Dropbox, you have access to it, so you can... Uh, download it or just read it in the in the cloud. Uh, there's this definition of soul, and let me give you uh, a few aspects of the idea of soul. As I've shown you, these clusters that Dr. Jung had in mind as psychic facts, and so uh, Dr. Jung said a couple of things, which I'm just going to cover the mountaintops of what he said, but. Um, First of all, the soul as a complex, uh, he said, it's a clearly demarcated functional complex that can be best be described as a personality. So it's a second personality within the psyche. And um, there can be multiple personalities in the psyche. Um, as we know, there's some famous ones in film, like the movie Sybil, um, but it's, um, it has actual characters, and it can be seen, and you can be seen as different in different milieus. For example, um, your, uh, the way you behave in your domestic life could be quite different from the way you behave in your uh, in world affairs or in your business life, as uh, Dr. Jung used the quote, uh, angel abroad, devil at home. And I suppose it could be turned around the other way, uh, devil abroad and angel at home. So I, and so I guess it's up to you to decide whether um, the president and the first lady and their son have this um, idealized uh, Norman Rockwell existence together in the White House, I'm not sure. Um, and um, it can also be a collective soul, and, um, and it can be the plaything of circumstance and general expectations. Okay, so that's as a complex, then the soul as a persona, uh, it can be uh, personal versus uh, versus uh, collective, and uh, there can be two personalities again. Uh, so persona would be if I pull my Marine Corps uniform out of the closet here and put it on, then I become a different person. Um, and, you know, I could literally feel that when I was active in the Marine Corps because when I put my uniform on, uh, I became a stereotypical Marine. Um, and that still happens when I, when I do wear it, which I do occasionally for honor salutes for the Hospice of the Chesapeake. But, um, 
in any case, those things are, um, you know, you can change your persona. And so my soul as a Marine is quite different from my soul as a teacher of Carl Jung's work, which is quite different again from my soul as a businessman. Um, there are certain common elements, but they're quite different. Um, and uh, let's see. Okay, then uh, soul as anima. Uh, and then I want to get into uh, this image a little bit. This is an image which appears in uh, Edward Edinger's The Ion Lectures. And it's so he did a whole series of lectures on Ion Volume 9 2. And um, you can find this in the Dropbox. But this particular diagram shows a, um, a visualization of the structure of the psyche. So at the deepest level, uh, you see here um, the self, which is the deepest archetype within the unconscious. And uh, it's also called the God image. And um, as both Dr. Edinger and Dr. Jung said, we can't tell the difference between the metaphysical God and um, the God image, which is uh, empirically demonstrable within the psyche. And so uh, Jungian analysts can definitely point to things that are from the self uh, as opposed to other issues. And so we know that it exists, and it exists at several different levels that uh, exists at the personal level, the historical level, uh, the world level, and in space-time. And this is going back to the Pleroma and Abraxas and all of that. And um, a lens through which we consider the outside world is either the animus or the anima, depending on whether we're a man or a woman. And so the three circles at the top are three different egos. One's a woman's ego, one's a theoretically neutral ego, and one's a man's ego. And so typically men will look out through their anima at the world. Um, and so the, the self of a man is looking out at the physical world uh, through his anima and a woman is looking out through the animus. And then coming back from the ego toward the self is the shadow. And that's all of the inferior parts of ourself. So if we look at the Myers-Briggs type indicator, um, I'm an introvert, so my inferior part, my shadow part would be an extrovert. But, you know, to a certain extent, I can put on extroversion. In other words, I can communicate with all of you who are online here right now. And uh, that doesn't bother me, even though, uh, in general, if I go to a party, I wouldn't want to be in a group this big. Uh, I would want to be over in a corner uh, just chatting with one or two people. And uh, so my inferior type is my extroversion and then um, then the next level is sensing and intuitive so a sensing person is someone you can show a thousand trees and they won't believe there's a forest and an intuitive person is someone you can show three trees and they assume there's a forest well my problem is that I test in the 99th percentile on the intuitive scale. And so my big problem is that I, I cannot see what you don't see. Okay, if you're less than 99th percentile intuitive, uh, I 
just can't grasp uh, what you don't see. So that's my inferior function. And so that's in my shadow. And then there's the thinking and feeling level. And I'm a thinker and most and you know most men think of themselves as thinkers per se uh, although the testing suggests we're about equal men and women thinkers and feelers um, but um, you know dr jung was constantly working from the feeling side he was he um, you know when if you look at my video about um, murder of the hero which is in the uh, in the red book uh, playlist you can find that on the front page of the channel um, dr jung had a hero in mind which in german men a hundred years ago was siegfried and he had to um, he had a dream about siegfried in which he killed this hero and he thought of that as his highest um, being. And yet when he killed that superior um, type that was within him and many other German men, um, then he could experience the feeling side. And much of his work emerges from the feeling side then after uh, he was able to overcome the strength of his primary um, type. So uh, whether he was a thinker or feeler at the beginning, it's not very clear, but because he was a, a scientist and always wanted to see himself as a scientist, um, I think that he was probably primarily a thinker at the beginning, but he was able to transcend over to the feeling side and that's what his work is about and then um, uh, there's the judging um, perceiving type which I've discussed before where uh, a judging person needs a, a list to go to the grocery store and a perceiving person just goes to the grocery store and takes things off the shelves that they see and both eat and so there's not any right or wrong way in any of these, but it differentiates 16 different personality types. And because there are these four scales, you can be anywhere on those scales um, and the person you're dealing with can be anywhere on those scales. So in terms of your interaction with that person, um, you know, there's no predicting, but it certainly does help to understand uh, the Myers-Briggs and uh, the MBTI, as it's called. And so I would urge you to, if you don't know about it, there's a free online test uh, that you can uh, take. I'll just put this uh, on the chat. Um, and people actually do give seminars that you go get trained for a couple of days and for about 500 bucks or a thousand dollars you get trained and then you can give these seminars to uh, various places it's a very good thing to do i think i just never have had time to do it um but um it, it is a way to make an income if you can sell yourself doing those Myers-Briggs programs. Um, and, um, you know, the U.S. military believes in this uh, test very strongly. Um, I went to four senior schools in the Marine Corps, uh, including uh, Command and Staff College, the Naval War College, and the National War College and the Industrial College of the Armed Forces. And in every one of them, uh, the Myers-Briggs was uh, presented uh, to us and, and we were trained in it because it's useful in trying to lead a, a group of men. So, okay, so Alex, I'm sorry I didn't get back to your uh, messages before you deleted them. Uh, 
and Marlon Dodd says, Alexa has pretty good voice recognition. Yeah, she also makes some bloopers. <laughs> and the oxide says, we are pattern recognizing hairless bipedal omnivorous primates who are smart enough to recognize the Godhead yet pride ourselves on denouncing existence itself. Uh, it is more futile, I guess, to presume that the self is a product of the pleromatic insolence, obedience, a cause of its projection or foes, possible recognition of it project beyond the aforementioned biannual. biannual. Um, I don't know. I, I can't quite follow what you're trying to say to us, Alex, here. Um, and Andy says, Newtonian reductionist thinking is the scourge of truly rational empirical thought. Um, alchemy holds up as good or better than modern science. Um, you know, I think both work. Obviously, we wouldn't have gotten anywhere near as far as we've gotten. We certainly uh, would not be having this conversation online around the world. And uh, I've had people access this channel from um, over 100 countries. So we would not be doing that without Newtonian reductionism and uh, the scientific method, per se. But that doesn't mean we already know everything. We don't. And uh, as soon as you create a rigid structure, um, something seeps in to change that, and, and you can't uh, stop that, and that's called life. And so, you know, as soon as I create a design for my teacup, um, then you know, the next minute somebody will design a different one or make it a different color or whatever it is. And we have to allow for that. We can't say that life is rigid. Uh, but I think I've probably left the, um, the structure of the psyche up long enough so that you can get the idea. And if you can't, you can go back to the replay and stop the video to see it. Um, and so, so my point, um, Andy, is that they both were, and we need to be sensitive to that fact. Okay, so now I've given you a sense of the soul image, so now I can go back and begin with paragraph 11, and so let me start to read it, and we can talk about it. So and it's nearly a page long. I'm going to read a sentence or two at a time and talk about them. So, Dr. Young says, an exclusively religious projection may rob the soul of its values so that through sheer inanition, inanition um, it becomes incapable of further development and gets stuck in an unconscious state. Okay, so the way I understand this, and the word inanition is a complicated one, so I'm going to put it on the chat. Uh, what, what I think he's saying is that um, religious systems of whatever kind give us a lot of detail and they fundamentally make um, what's in the soul seem not important and therefore inane uh, is the way he's saying it here and so the the soul which is part of our psyche uh, gets stuck and it can't change and so uh, you could think of it as the religions flashbang us and so that we you know we see this bright shiny object whatever it is that uh, that we see whether it's the star of david or 
Christ hanging on the cross or whatever it is, and it makes it doesn't allow us to develop. And um, you know, I remember when I was a little boy, my parents who were from different Protestant sects were trying to decide what church to go to, and so they started to every Sunday try a different church. And one day, uh, my father dropped us off in front of the Catholic Church, not realizing that it was a Catholic Church and therefore not Protestant of any sort. And my mother and we three children walked into the church and the three children were saying, wow, isn't all this stuff cool, you know? And, and, uh, and you know, because there's statues and Christ hanging on the cross and uh, the various other things and um and that was and so i can imagine that you know if you're if you get taken into the catholic church newly you can just have your your own psyche just overwhelmed by that and and so that's what dr young himself himself uh says that happens that does happen Okay, now, let's see, going back. And he says, literally the people who invented quantum physics were alchemists, uh, Wolfgang Pauli, Oppenheimer, etc. Um, yeah, um, and certainly Wolfgang Pauli was, um, was, trained by Jung over over some many years of time. And uh, Alex, Andy says it's the belief that matters. And um, you know, it just depends on what level you're trying to get to, Andy. And I, I, what I'm working toward is that Dr. Young believed that the human species uh, was striving for a m new level of consciousness. Okay, so when he, when he was asked whether he believed in God, and he said, I have no need to believe, I know. And, you know, my epiphany at that moment was that I too know. And so what do we know? Well, we know something that is beyond the teachings of any religion, okay? And it's a different level of consciousness. It's a level that you can reach through a religious experience. It, it happens um, actually in AA, for example. Uh, and if you've ever had one of these religious experiences, and there are a couple on uh, this YouTube channel under the Breakthroughs to the Unconscious playlist, um, then you know, okay? And then the need for a creed falls away, but, um, but then you can realize that whatever tradition that you're used to following, that tradition can help you along your path of life because it is a refined method to reach the, um, the ineffable, okay? And whether you understand that or not, I don't know, but um, if you get to that level of consciousness, uh, you no longer need a creed, but the creed can help you. So what my experience was, it was that as a Christian, I had lots of doubts and uh, pastors that I tried to question about holes in the myths um, were ill-equipped to respond to me. And um, I didn't understand why. And um, and then I be 
became a Buddhist, or I didn't become a Buddhist, but I started practicing Buddhist, Buddhism, and uh, my wife became a, a lay Buddhist teacher. Um, and so we have lots of uh, counterpart discussions between Jungian psychology and Buddhism. Um, but when I became a Buddhist, it made me a better Christian. Uh, and because Buddhism is not a competing religion, it's actually a philosophy of life because there's no God, no saint, no sinners, no apostles, no right, no wrong, etc. And it's really much more like Jungian psychology. And so when I became a Buddhist, and started to practice meditation and so on, I became a better Christian. And when I became a Jungian and really got into studying Jung, uh, I became a better Buddhist and a better Christian. And so, uh, so it's not really a question of belief. It's either you know or you don't know. And if you have to have a belief, then you're not there yet. Okay, very simply. I mean, and that's that's the new level of consciousness that we should be striving for, which is if you have to hold on to something and believe it and have to grasp onto that and clutch that to hold your psyche together, that, you know, and there are a lot of people that do need that, okay? And, and Dr. Jung was uh, very specific that uh, religions were... Um, organically developed methods of psychotherapy that came up over uh, thousands of years. And as Peter Kingsley talked about with Parmenides and, uh, and those early Greek and um, Southern Italian philosophers, that's what they were doing. They were basically doing psychotherapy. That's what the priests were doing. And and so it, there's been a need for it all along. They didn't know they were practicing psychotherapy at that time because we didn't even really think about the psyche until uh, about 200 years ago, let's say. Um, but, you know, William Blake knew it when he did his, uh, when he, he did his Job engravings, for example. And uh, if you find on this YouTube channel, um, the encounters with the self. Let me see if I have that link right here. Um, I, I read, um, I read into the YouTube channel encounters with the self by William Blake, what, uh, which Dr. Edinger called his, um, portable analytic hour. Okay. And so here was William Blake. Uh, about um, 200 years ago, uh, doing these these etchings, which uh, let's see, I guess I don't have the link right handy, uh, but just look at the at the home page of this YouTube channel. You'll find uh, a series of links across the bot, uh, the lower side of it with Edinger, and you'll find those two videos where I read that um, into the system. And so those were, um, you know, those came up spontaneously within William Blake over 200 years ago and long before there was a Freud or a Jung, and they're quite uh, reading them with the Edinger lens is quite interesting. Um, ah, well, now let's see. Um, Alex says, you should do an overview of the Jung Pauli correspondences sometimes. Um, yeah, I'd love to. I mean, I, I actually have Adam and Archetype and read it. Um, it's, it's not like it's a quick thing to do. I mean, there's many letters there. And, and actually, as we go forward here uh, with this, okay, and we're, we're reading this, 
and the second part of this after paragraph 43, and we're still in the first sentence of paragraph 11, uh, but after paragraph 43 is uh, Wolfgang Pauli's uh, individuation uh, dreams, and he worked with a Jungian analyst uh, for about a decade and produced a thousand dreams. And so in Psychology and Alchemy, uh, Dr. Jung has um, analyzed these dreams. And um, because they are an example of the individuation process. Now I put a, a couple of uh, psychological cycles now on the front page, um, including you know, these conjunctio images. This is sort of a cheat sheet of, um, of the process. It's a, it's a pressy of it. And so, um, so I will be talking about that in, at some point in the future. So, you know, what I'm trying to do now with this group is trying to be available to all of you to discuss Q&A and work through some of Dr. Jung's primary work. And, um, and so as I'm doing that, um, we will talk about these things. Um, and so, yes, the, the Jung Pauli correspondence and, and engagement is certainly a part of that. Um, and he says, he's touched on it. You want to see the real modern day weirdo, check out Jack Parsons. He did ancient hermetic uh, magic and invented solid rocket fuel. Okay. Um, you know, there are plenty of weirdos that have done amazing things as, uh, as the sort of the lead quote from the imitation game goes. Um, it's only people who, from whom no one can imagine anything coming, who do things that no one can imagine. And uh, that's definitely true. Uh, and also shared a party house with Aleister Crowley and L. Ron Hubbard eventually found Jet Propulsion lab Laboratories. Cool. <laughs> Alex, futurity grows out of the one, out of one, one do not create it, and yet one does, though not deliberately and willfully, but rather against will and intention. In this manner, we cannot reach the future. We artificially produce a constant present, everything that we would like to break into the present strikes us as a disturbance and we seek to drive it away so that our intention survives but how can i be more my how can i be my own charity charioteer <clears throat> without will and intention well you know it's fine to be your own charioteer with will and intention but what you need to do is understand what yourself is saying, because no matter what um, what your will and intention may be, if your um, if your self isn't going to cooperate with you on that, uh, then it's going to stop you. Okay, and you know this comes from paragraph seven forty six of Answer to Job. Uh, where he's talking about the individuation process. And the individuation process is something that you can either do consciously or unconsciously. And um, what he says here, paragraph 746 of Answer to Job, something empirically demonstrable comes to our aid from the depths of our unconscious nature. It is the task of the conscious mind to understand these hints. If this does not happen, the process of individuation will nevertheless continue. The only difference is that we become its victims, 
and are dragged along by fate toward that inescapable goal which we might have reached walking upright. And so you can have will and tension all you want, but if, if yourself isn't going to cooperate with you on that, um, then you're not going to get there. And, you know, my life is a, is a perfect example about that. I mean, my will and intention was to become a Marine Corps general, but one fine day, um, my psyche made me, um, <clears throat> let's say, careless on an icy uh, parking lot, and <clears throat> I went down and broke my leg, and... 28 years later, um, last Valentine's Day, I had to get a new ankle because of that. And uh, I've lived with it ever since that day. Um, but that definitely ended my Marine Corps career. And you can say that that was, but that was just an accident. Well, yes, but <laughs> your self has a way of uh, giving you accidents. And I'm convinced of Dr. Jung's definition of God, which I'll repeat for you here, which is God is the name by which I designate all things which cross my willful path violently and recklessly, all things which upset my subjective views, plans, and intentions, and change the course of my life for better or for worse. Because if it's all will and intention, then you don't need God, okay? But but people can't live that way, and it doesn't work that way. Uh, you know, if it's all will and intention, then, then um, you know, our president would be having a fine old time in the White House and everything would be hunky-dory, but it's not all will and intention. And so, uh, you know, he's, regardless of what, position you have res with respect to him and his administration, you have to acknowledge that he's not having the final time he thought he would have when he was president. And so that's how, you know, if it was all will and intention, everything would be hunky-dory and he wouldn't have fired all these people from his administration. Um, <clears throat> Okay, um, so I'll let people read Alex's reference to the uh, Greek God stories, gods and goddesses stories. And he says, LSD is a hell of a drug, Alex. Um, okay, well, we don't recommend drugs here, so I'd appreciate it if you would not uh, discuss drugs. Dr. Young was not a big fan of drugs um, to get to the unconscious. He acknowledged that it was a way to do it. Uh, Alex says, LSD, as the name implies, is lysergic. The processes discussed are far from it. They, are, they in fact signify an indulgence in ergon at their utmost literally. It's all Greek to me. Well, it's Greek to me too, and so um, you know, we're, we're not promoting drugs on this YouTube channel, and so I would appreciate it if you would cease and desist on those points. And uh, if, if you want to hear what Dr. Jung said about it, go back to the pre last week's session. I think it was in last week's session where I uh, read Dr. Young's actual position vis a vis drugs. Okay, let me see if I can get into the second sentence here. <clears throat> so we're talking about um, the soul, and he says, at the same time, it falls victim, so the soul falls victim, to the delusion that the cause of its misfortune lies outside, and people no longer stop to ask themselves, how far it is their own doing. Okay, so when things go bad, um, maybe 
you were somehow involved and you are, you need to ask yourself whether that's the case if you can just project it out because you know this is god's will or whatever um, then you're never going to take responsibility for your life are you and so so insignificant does the soul seem that it is regarded as hardly capable of evil much less good so you know people don't think that they're capable of evil and yet we do evil all the time as as uh, paul said the evil that i would not do i do okay uh, but if the soul no longer has any part to play religious life congeals into externals and formalities so instead of the soul and your um, instead of the soul providing the spirit the spirit is controlled by these religious uh, structures and so it it uh, atrophies and then you have to follow the rules of your uh, faith tradition um, instead of deciding for yourself and this is what we got into uh, earlier when I was reading about karma and the point is that um, having somebody else set the rules uh, doesn't always work uh, <clears throat> However, we may picture the relationship between God and the soul. One thing is certain, that the soul cannot be nothing but. Okay, so the, there is something that is there. On the contrary, it has the dignity of an entity endowed with consciousness of a relationship to deity. Okay, so now we go back to uh, the structure that Edinger was talking about. Okay, so the soul, in this case, partially is anima or animus, and it has connection with self, which also is referred to in Jungian psychology as the God image, and keeping in mind that um, human beings can't differentiate between the God image, which is empirically identifiable in the clinical setting, and the metaphysical God. And so, therefore, everybody's atom or animus has a connection to uh, deity, relationship to deity. And so, there, therefore, soul means something. It's important. It, it has a meaning for us. Even if, we were, even if it were only the relationship of a drop of water to the sea, that sea would not exist but for the multitude of drops. The immortality of the soul insisted upon by dogma exalts it above the transitoriness of mortal man and causes it to partake of some supernatural quality. And so, you know, it's easiest to see in, um, in an average or uh, in artists because they're expressing their soul, um, but it can be anything. I mean, it, it can be as simple as some piece of advice you give a child one time during your life, which has tremendous meaning for them, and it causes them to do something that's spectacular. And, uh, and you can't predict what that might be, but that's your soul having an impact on it. And I will give you a link to the trailer of a movie called Welcome to Happiness, which I really urge you to look at this movie. It's a very, it's a very feel good movie. Ultimately, it, it's, it's very, it's very surprising in many ways, but I, I, I truly love this movie. And uh, one of the good things about it is that it shows you how different things impact different parts of your life and the lives of others. And they may be minor things, they may be either bad or good things, but nonetheless, uh, they have a tremendous impact. Um, 
and Alex, let's see, okay. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so it, it thus infinitely surpasses the perishable conscious individual insignificance, so that logically the Christian is forbidden to regard the soul as nothing but as the eye of the sun, as the eye to the sun, so the, the soul corresponds to God. So, uh, in other words, our soul, um, we either know God or we don't, okay? And uh, you can believe that there's a God if you're convinced by others, uh, but if you know God, then you've come to a new level of human consciousness. And that knowing is in the psyche, okay? There's no puppet master up above us. Uh, guiding our lives. There's no puppet master that you can pray to that'll prevent you from having an accident tomorrow. Uh, if there's anything that's in your life that is going to prevent that, it's, it's in you. It comes from you. Um, Alex says, we attack each other in fratricidal struggles since one senses the approaching God is in the other. This is quite coherent with the soul parallelism. Parallelism is strong. We have created it. We are created in that way, says Andy. Duality is inherent. And Andy says, will forces the change from neutral and balance to positive or negative. Um, and Alex says, I believe it is also highlighted in the final segments before the Septim Sermonis in the Red Book. Uh, that may very well be. Um, and Andy says, I bought the big version of the Red Book. It's amazing. Yep, it surely is. Okay, going on. <clears throat> Since our conscious mind does not comprehend the soul, it is restored ridiculous to speak of the things of the soul in patronizing or depreciatory manner. Even the believing Christian does not know God's hidden ways and must leave him to decide whether he will work on man from the outside or from within through the soul. Okay, and this is where uh, Welcome to Happiness comes in because you can see how God uh, works his way with us. Um, so the believer should not boggle at the fact that there is, uh, uh, there are dreams sent by God and illuminations of the soul, which cannot be traced back to any external causes. It would be blasphemy to assert that God can manifest himself everywhere, save only in the human soul. Um, you know, certainly... God can manifest anywhere, and the will of God can be manifest anywhere, uh, and especially the will of God as uh, Dr. Jung de uh, defined it and I gave to you earlier. Um, indeed, the very intimacy of the relationship between God and the soul precludes from the start any devaluation of the latter, okay? Um, and so that presumes that you have a, uh, a, an understanding of how yourself, your God image, is interacting with you and is giving you images that can tell you what the will of God is today. And, um, you know, I hear that every day nowadays, and uh, so I know it's there. Um, it would be going perhaps too far to speak of an affinity, but at all events the soul must contain in itself the faculty of relationship to God. 
i.e. a correspondence, otherwise a connection could never come about. Okay, so um, you know, again, with this image from Dr. Edinger, um, you know, the part of the soul as defined by Dr. Jung in this image is the anima or the animus. And as you can see, the, it's, uh, direct, it's basically a lens over the, the uh, self, um, the God image. Okay, so this correspondence is, in psychological terms, the archetype of the God image. So, um, so this is what he's talking about, which is the self, and this is the way it appears. Now, when we're born, and there are other, an ego and archetype, which is another of Dr. Edinger's books, which you have access to. Um, Dr. Edinger gives some other diagrams where he shows how the ego slowly emerges from the self, because when we're born uh, as infants, um, we are wild animals and we are everything is self so as you know if you've been around little babies they're little gods and they're little kings and queens and everything that they want they have to get or else and it's only gradually that their ego emerges because somebody says no to them and then um then the joe bark the Job archetype starts to work. So um, there's a contest between mommy and the baby, uh, and uh, the baby loses that contest. So there's a defeat, and the baby laments about that defeat, and then it gets reborn with a little bit more ego, and so it knows next time it better not bite that nipple type thing uh, or whatever it is that the parent is trying to teach the baby that time it, each of these defeats each of these pains makes you stronger and makes your ego stronger and so that goes on into life and into your education um, and um, Let's see. Alex says, quite a prologue to the laments of the dead. Absolutely. Uh, Alex says, I agree. They did an amazing job regarding Liber Novus. The reader's edition is quite convenient as well. And yeah, and I feel that you need both because um, I mark up books and. Um, you know, someone once asked Dr. Jung, apparently, whether he had a spiritual practice, and his answer was, my spiritual act, uh, practice is marking up books. <laughs> as, you, as you've seen, I can really relate to that. <laughs> so, every one of those tabs is a place that I could write a long essay. Uh, about what Dr. Jung said. <laughs> okay, so I managed to get through paragraph 11 <laughs> and didn't get into paragraph 12, but I think we've had an interesting discussion here. Um, and Andy Siskip, do you think Jung's body of work is the end-all explanation of, or perhaps a tool to push our understanding even further. Andy, I definitely think it's a tool. I don't think it's the end all. And um, as uh, as I've said a few times, uh, people like uh, Ann Belford Ulanoff, uh, who wrote this book, this book is actually four lectures that Dr. Ulanoff uh, gave to Episcopal bishops, believe it or not, 30 years ago, uh, in which she talked about the wisdom of the psyche. And, um, and this image on the cover, by the way, is an image by her husband, Barry Ulanoff, who she also wrote six books with. She worked, she's written 16 books so far, 
by herself and another six with her husband, uh, who apparently has passed away at this point. But um, Anne Belford Ulanoff has taken Dr. Jung's work to another plateau. And she's done that in her service as professor of psychiatry and religion at Union Theological Seminary. So she's quite a unique individual. And, um, and so, and she did criticize Dr. Young for falling for the devil's trick. And uh, so let's mention what the devil's trick is before we close here tonight. The devil's trick would be uh, if your child comes to you and says they're gay, for example, um, do you spend your time arguing about the pros and cons of homosexuality, or do you spend your time with what Dr. Ulanoff calls first things first, which is how you hold your family together under that situation? Okay, the devil's trick is to start ar arguing about something that, that's a sterile debate, and these debates are sterile in our society, and rather do that debate rather than uh, do the debate that really matters for you and your family. And, um, you know, I have faced it in my own family where... Um, one part of my family is, has uh, somewhat opposite political points of view from mine. Uh, and uh, we did have one rankle um, for about an hour over the issue of abortion. And, but after that, I said, stop, we're not going to discuss this and um, we're not going to debate politics within the family because um, it will just destroy the family. And so since we made that uh, commitment to one another, and, and we made that commitment before I read about the devil's trick, that um, it turns out that my instinct was the right one, which is that, you know, if you want to destroy your family, uh, go ahead and argue about one of these sterile debates, but if you want to um, have your family and have your grandchildren around you when you're my age, then you better not do it. And so Dr. Bel Dr. Olinoff's point is that Dr. Jung stayed in his lane. He stayed on the psychology side of the psychology theology debate and the point is that we have to straddle it we have to provide a bridge between theology and psychology and so that's what she has done in a lot of her writing uh, it's what i'm trying to do uh, because i do understand the value of organized religion now in that context i can tell you that after my experience with Mephistopheles, I was quite angry uh, for quite some time. Um, and, uh, and I was very upset with organized, some organized religion in the United States. However, now I have come to terms with it um, because I see uh, what organized religion can uh, do for us. And so um, I now, um, you know, I, I object to cultism and, and religions that force you to do this or that. And, um, and those are, you know, those are, very, those are very wrong, but those are also not truly religions in my view uh, but you know true organized religion as they've come back down to us through the last 1500 to 3500 years um, 
those religions, and you know, Taoism is even older than that, so is Hinduism, um, they all have their value, okay, and they all have served as uh, organized psychotherapy for people as we were developing as a species in that period of time which is a nanosecond in terms of uh, the time that when um, the evolution takes place. But, um, and, and so in terms of reaching this new level of consciousness, we have to realize, as Dr. Edinger did, that what Dr. Jung had done was find the source of all religions and I'll just give you access to my transcript of that um, that uh, interview that Dr. Edinger did which I highlighted unfortunately this interview is not no longer available online uh, but I, I was afraid that might happen and so I took it upon myself to transcribe what he said and to highlight it. Uh, and so Art says, can you be sexual and spiritual at the same time? Well, uh, Art, I think you need to go to, um, uh, I think it's the sixth Sermon of the Dead and hear what Dr. Jung said about that. It's quite interesting uh, because he was, uh, and it's the, it's the sermon that talks about, um, uh, about communion and, um, uh, yeah, about communion and, and uh, religious, uh, let me see, I, let me get the correct name of it. Uh, because I did it very recently. I hope I don't lose you as I go to my dashboard here. Uh, but um, <clears throat> let's see. Let's see if it comes up quickly here. Okay, so it is. Ah, okay. It is the fifth and sixth sermons to the dead, which are about the church and Holy Communion. And what you will find in that sermon um, is that it never once mentions a church or communion, not once. And, um, And so, and the point is that it does talk about spirituality and sexuality. Um, and so, let me get back into this. Uh, I hope I, you're all still here. Okay, so this is the fifth and sixth sermons to the dead. And it says it's about the church and Holy Communion. Uh, but you'll find that um, neither the church nor Holy Communion is mentioned at all, only spirituality and sexuality, which are um, uh, intimately intertwined in Jungian psychology. And um, if I, I can share with you something about Tibetan Buddhism here. When I first saw one of these, I said, now there's a religion for me. Okay, so here's uh, the Buddha, and he is in union with a daikini. And some of these statues I've seen are anatomically correct on the bottom side, but this one is not. Um, but in any case, um, sexuality and spirituality are definitely connected. And so, um, going back. And uh, Art, I, I also find that, that sexuality is quite spiritual. I, and, you know, you 
probably have enough experiences like that too, so you, that you don't have to go uh, to Google for that. Um, okay, so um, we have been here for two hours. We have gotten through one paragraph of uh, psychology and alchemy. At this rate, we will finish <laughs> psychology and alchemy in about 10 years. Um, and uh, But I do want this session to be more interactive and um, dealing with issues you may wish to bring up. And so I, I've been trying to do that more regularly. I hope you feel that that's the case. And, um, and I am going to continue doing it using psychology and alchemy as a stepping off point. Now, in our advanced reading group, that is operated much more like a, a um, graduate school seminar. And we do that on uh, Zoom. And so it is an interactive uh, video conference, uh, so everybody gets a chance to speak and uh, say their piece. So if you wish to join our, um, our advanced group, I hope you will do that. Uh, we, we never throw anything away, and so um, it, it, you can join any time and see everything we've done from the beginning, although you won't be participating in it. And uh, I finally figured out how to do uh, opening and closing credits. And so when I, uh, when I change the scene here this next time, uh, I'll have my closing credits uh, up on the screen uh, so that you can uh, see those. Um, I do have uh, one producer uh, for, for this group, uh, which I appreciate very much. And uh, if others want to be uh, included as producers, uh, you can find the method for doing that on the Patreon page, on my Patreon page. Um, <clears throat> and um, so anyway, thank you for joining me uh, today. And I will see you again next week, February 4th. And, uh, and for the advanced group, we will be having the final seminar on um, ION on this Wednesday, where we're going to be discussing your reactions to the overall book and finishing out uh, Barbara Hanna's comments about ION. So thank you for joining me this evening. I look forward to seeing you next week. And here are the closing credits. One other thing I would add, um, Art, is that, you know, a lot of what Dr. Jung had to say uh, had to do with experience. And so, you know, Google's not the place to look for the answer to that question. Uh, the place to look for the answer to that question is with your, um, with your sex, sexual and spiritual partner and uh, then you'll have the answer and you'll know you don't have to have anybody tell you uh, what the answer is and so anyway just leave it at that